Hello, everyone. I'm Daryl Lamont Jenkins, and as the honorary chair of this event, I would like to welcome you to the 2019 Homegrown Violent Extremism Digital Summit. If you're participating, you are as concerned as I am about the political climate that is taking a dark shift into something that threatens the society we work so hard to create. This is the critical time, and we will see how this society, how this nation will react to it in the voting booths less than a year from today. Regardless of the outcome of next year's presidential election, however, we will still have that threat of domestic extremism that has sadly enjoyed over the past four years a mainstream presence that we thought we would never allow, and we should do everything we can to prevent its allowance in the future. It is that effort that I've been involved with for over 30 years, and I hope you are as dedicated as I and those who work with have been. Now, for those who don't know, I am the founder and executive director of One People's Project, an organization we founded in 2000 to monitor and report on right-wing groups and individuals. We encourage communities to be proactive against them and diminish their ability to function in this society because regardless of the mainstream face they put on their ideals, they make it clear that they are a threat to all of us with their open embrace of fascist elements, threats of civil war, if we insist on going in the political direction they do not have approve of, and most importantly, and tragically, violence that we have seen kill dozens of innocent people over the past four years alone. My organization's work had meant those engaging in such efforts have found themselves out of political power, unemployed, and basically made into virtual pariahs. In addition, we have encouraged those who have been involved in hate and extremist ideals to pull themselves away from those circles and build a life that does not rely on the diminishing of others. Movies such as Skin and documentaries such as Alt-Right Age of Rage detail our past efforts and why we engage in them. So if you would like an idea as how we navigated those waters in the past, you can check those productions out. But those productions show only a small portion of the kind of fight that we all have had to wage and will wage in the future. You know, the panels that we will participate in today We'll explain that fight in detail and the different facets of that fight. We will hear from survivors of extremist violence. We will learn the tactics extremists use online and how to combat them. We will also hear from those who used to be among those extremist circles and work today to pull others out as well. I actually remember watching one of the panelists on an episode of the Montel Williams show 20 years ago promoting that extremism. And a few months ago, I met him by chance in Washington, D.C., as we both attended a congressional hearing on white supremacy. We were both on the same side. So I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say today, and we will definitely have more of an understanding about this political climate. Now, last Sunday was the 40th anniversary of the Greensboro shootings, where Klansmen shot and killed several persons protesting them. Many of us might have observed that day and thought of how we still seem to be fighting that particular battle. And yes, we are. But we are on better footing than those that counted the Klan in that day. And I am optimistic that as we go forward in our work and in our efforts, we will be able to once again regulate that hate element back into irrelevance. And if we are dedicated enough, eradicate it entirely. So once again, I want to thank you for participating in the summit. And I hope we will all come away with new information and understandings as we go forward. Thank you very much. Welcome to the University of Southern California Homegrown Violent Extremism Digital Summit. My name is Jack Knott, and I am the Dean of the USC Sol Price School of Public Policy. For those of you whose responsibilities include public safety or national security, allow me to thank you for your service to our city and our nation. It is the safety and security of our country and our communities that bring us here today. While we express our gratitude to those nations and persons responsible for eliminating the leader of ISIS, we remain cognizant of the growing homegrown threats of violence in America perpetrated by groups or individuals motivated by an extremist ideology. Last year was the fourth deadliest year on record for domestic extremist-related killings since 1970. These challenges include the threat of hate crimes, which are occurring at unprecedented levels across the country. Anti-Semitic hate crimes have increased 21% since last year, and there have been five attacks on American houses of worship since 2015. 
The most effective best practice for reducing the risk of these attacks is community engagement, brought about by education, awareness, and action. For 90 years, the Price School has earned the public trust by creating path-breaking research and scholarship. Our mandate is to bring rigorous fact-based research to bear on the ethical and societal problems of our time. In keeping with that mandate, today's Homegrown Violent Extremism, or HVE, Digital Summit convenes an extraordinary interdisciplinary collection of counterterrorism experts, academics, former extremists, public health practitioners, researchers, and victims to examine and share their findings regarding the complexities of HVE. These informed conversations are more important than ever, and I believe that together we can make a difference for our communities and our society. Thank, Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Errol Southers, and I am the director of the Safe Communities Institute and professor of the practice in National and Homeland Security. Thanks to the support of Dean Willow Bay of the Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism and Dean Jack Knott of the Saul Price School of Public Policy, we are able to bring you today's Homegrown Violent Extremism Digital Summit. As you've heard some of the statistics, the facts are indisputable. Ideologically motivated violence continues to haunt every part of the American landscape, as does violence more generally. As we respond to this issue, we are always faced with two looming questions. Why does this happen? And what can we do to reduce the risks? Today, we are presenting three panels, hoping to get to the heart of this complex challenge by responding to some additional considerations for the purpose of yielding possible solutions. What happens to survivors when these attacks do occur? Victims and communities struggle with physical and psychological ramifications after an attack. The first panel features a survivor of extremist violence, as well as experts who can offer insights on the challenges and needs they face. We often hear, it's social media and video games. Well, is it? We know violent extremists increasingly use online forums to share hate, promote their ideologies, and even stream videos of their attacks. Panel two explores what are we doing about this or what can we do? Last but not least, can we pull extremists away from hate and violence? No one knows better than a former extremist or the experts who help counsel them out of the movement. Are there tools or approaches that we might motivate adherents to disengage and reject their extremist ideology? Well, let's find out. We're going to discuss all of this and more during today's summit. I'm very excited, and I hope you are too. So let's get started. Greetings, everyone. I'm Dr. Lavana Lewis, and I'm here as a moderator for this morning's panel dealing with the survivals uh, of extreme violence. Uh, I consider it a pleasure and an honor to be in the company of the, both the survivors and those who are handling the trauma of survival. Um, I hope that during our time together, you get a sense of the, not just the devastation, but also the hope that comes from the events that we're going to be talking about today and the organizations that are critical uh, in terms of helping others uh, respond to tragedy and also the personal struggles or the personal responses to those tragedies. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and uh, their organizations. Uh, I'm going to call them Cynthia, Josh, and Tony, and they will give you more detail about who they are and the incredible organizations that they're that they spend their time lobbying for and the people they lobby on behalf of. So Cynthia, please. Thank you. Very delighted to be here and honored to be a part of this panel uh, this morning. My name is Cynthia Deedle. I am the program director for the Matthew Shepard Foundation, which is headquartered in Denver, Colorado. The foundation was started 21 years ago by Dennis and Judy Shepard, following the loss of their son, Matthew, who was killed in the most uh, widely known anti-gay hate crime in Laramie, Wyoming. Following his death, um, his parents decided to turn their grief into action and become true advocates for LGBTQ youth, to become advocates to tell Matt's story, and to do whatever they could to protect other individuals from suffering from anti-hate violence. What we do in the foundation is three things primarily. One is the telling of Matt's story, as I mentioned. He uh, was a very precocious young man, and his parents, I, I do believe, enjoyed telling the world who he was and sharing 
who he was as a person. So people have a window into that personality and that human being, and they don't just see him as a victim. So they do quite a number of engagements throughout the country and internationally as well, telling that story. They also give a very profound message of hope and um, striving for a more accepting and inclusive future. The other thing that we do is we support productions of The Laramie Project, the play, um, throughout the country and the world. We also support productions of the documentary Matt Shepard is a Friend of Mine, as well as the oratorio Considering Matthew Shepard. My primary responsibility with the foundation is to uh, manage and execute their hate crime training program. And what that encompasses is training state and local and federal police officers and prosecutors to not only identify hate crimes, but investigate and prosecute them as well. And over, I think, the past 18 months, we've trained over 800 individuals um, to recognize hate crimes and value the importance of hate crime enforcement. Um, along with that curriculum, of course, is really trying to stress the importance of what you said, which is the value of bringing law enforcement and the community together to keep both of them safe and to understand each other and to try to do everything they can together in a cohesive manner to combat hate. Thank you. Thank Josh. you. My name is Josh Stepikoff. I, uh, I survived the North Valley Jewish Community Center shooting back in August of 1999, which was enacted by a neo-Nazi who had access to uh, high-powered uh, high powered firearms, and, and he had a desire to, uh, to send a wake-up call to America to kill Jews. And um, so I was six years old at the time of that, and I have had a long, it's now been 20 years, and it's been a long road to recovery, and um, I've spent the last probably about 10 or 12 years sharing my story and taking part in the conversation, not only about hate crimes, but also what it means to live with post-traumatic stress disorder and what these tragedies look like for the people, um, you know, a couple years down the line, couple months down the line after these things happen. So uh, I try and share my, my story in hopes that um, we, can, we can come together as a community to provide better support for people uh, after they go through these types of hate crimes. I also serve on the board of directors for Women Against Gun Violence. And um, we're a local nonprofit based out of Culver City, Los Angeles. And we do all sorts of amazing work from legislative action to um, just to, to being a voice in the community to allow people to, to learn about gun violence and, uh, and contribute their voices to, to the cause. Thank you. Dr. Tony Belize. My name is Tony Belize, and I'm an instructor here at USC in the uh, Safe Communities Institute. I'm also senior advisor for the North American Center for Threat Assessment and Trauma Response, and currently a consultant with Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health uh, School Threat Assessment and Response Team. And the focus of the work is early identification, prevention through training, education, and situational awareness to uh, not only help first responders identify and react to things in a proactive way, but provide uh, education to the community so that we can take proactive steps to prevent these things from happening. So thank you. I think oftentimes we get the initial story, but some of the follow-up. And just kind of getting a sense of how do you think that, um, I think that people are generally not aware in, in many instances about the community uh, impact of some of these attacks. Can you kind of walk us through some of that information that you're sharing and that you think is kind of critical for people to understand about, again, the community collective impact? I think what, what I've seen in my experience both when I was a special agent with the FBI and now with the Matthew Shepard Foundation is that due primarily to the expansive social media presence in our world, whenever there's a report of a very significant hate crime, everybody knows about it in a very short period of time. If you look back at the initial postings when the Pulse nightclub was hit in Orlando, Florida, and how fast that information was spread throughout social media um, it, it really brings home how far-ranging hate can become. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen is that 
a perpetrator of a hate incident or a hate crime, yes, is targeting a particular human being or a particular location, but he's also primarily targeting that community. So whether it's the Tree of Life Synagogue, whether it's Pulse, whether it's the, the death of Matthew Shepard, um, whatever the hate crime is, it sends that message that that group of people is now under attack. And the Williams Institute at UCLA, along with several other organizations, have done amazing work looking at the impact of hate, not just to that targeted victim. And what they've seen is that it, it causes not just that psychological trauma to the victim, but also to that community. And what that looks like over time is fear. It's fear to go outside your home. It's fear to go to work. It's fear to go to school. It's fear to be who you are and who you're comfortable being, whether that's LGBTQ or that's Jewish or Muslim or Hispanic, whatever, however you identify, and we all identify as multiple things, mm -hmm. but however you identify, if that one classification or category is now under attack, chances are you're going to withdraw. And that has a devastating impact on families, on friends, on communities and houses of worship if people are not free of fear to just live their lives openly as who they are. But you definitely can see it and you see it with the vigils. Every time there's a, there's a hate crime incident, you see all the vigils across the country and across the world, everyone holding candles and crying. And you think, what happens after the candle's blown out? Mm -hmm. What happens after they go home? They're scared. And that's the whole point of why these crimes are committed is to instill that fear. And we have to do a much better job of crushing that fear and bringing people back out into the light. When, and to expand on that, even with the, in regards to the vigils. So um, yesterday marked the one year anniversary of the borderline shooting, which was a nightclub in Thousand Oaks, not far from here. Right. And there was a massive vigil yesterday. And we're now looking at one year afterwards. And those people are all still affected. It's something that they all still continue to struggle with and deal with on a daily basis. And I think what a lot of people, you know, we talk about the news cycle and how quick the news cycle is. So, you know, it's covered on the news for, a, a mass shooting is covered on the news for a couple days and then, or a week maybe. and then we have to recognize that, so when I got shot, I was the one who got shot. I dealt with, you know, all of my own, my own issues, but then we had my family, my extended family, friends who were at the Jewish Community Center on the day of the shooting and also went through, you know, traumatic experience watching, um, watching other kids get shot. Uh, I remember after I had kind of cleared the the area where the, the shooting was actually going on, I was laying on the floor with a bunch of young kids staring at me. They all have to live with that image in their head. They all have to deal with that. The counselors, the, the staff, the law enforcement, it's a very widespread thing. I don't have a dollar amount to it. You might maybe have a dollar amount to it. It's expensive as well for all the law enforcement, for the health care, um, for all of the resources that are needed to respond to these types of things. It has a wide reaching effect that's not only mental health, it's not only the individual who was directly affected, but all of the people attached to them. You know, I have family in, in multiple different states and mul multiple different areas, they all were dealing with this in different ways and they, everyone had to, to cope with it. And so it's not just, you know, this small, small community who's affected. It takes a very large toll. Um, and I think, you know, I think Borderline was a, a good representation of that. One year afterwards, there was a massive, massive response and a lot of people still coming together. You look at Las Vegas uh, after the, the shooting at, um, at the festival they're still dealing with it. The survivors are still dealing with it. The people who live in Las Vegas are still dealing with it. It is a large, large community of people who become affected by it. If I may just add one personal note to that. So um, my son attended a JCC several years ago and I had never met you until now. I never had the pleasure. But what happened there in California impacted how I felt about about putting my son into a JCC all the way across the country. Yeah. 
remembering that. I never met you, I wasn't there, but it impacted me and my family thinking, how are we going to protect this structure and protect our son from not having to deal with what happened to you? So you think about just how widespread that is, so thank you. So Dr. Belize, could you talk a little bit about this, this idea of um, trying to provide um, a way forward for some of the communities in terms of how do you prepare people, the, the first responders, the, the trainers, to go into communities, not just in, in the immediate aftermath, but preparing for those kind of longer term issues in terms of associated with recovery after some of the events. Sure. Two things I want to comment on relevant to what uh, my colleagues just mentioned. One is that I think one of the biggest viruses we have now is this concept that I came up with called isonection, that we find a significant group of people that are psychologically, socially, or emotionally isolated, mm -hmm. but connected through social media. Mm -hmm. And through that social media, there's the recruitment, there's the, the endorsement of violence, the endorsements of extreme hate, a lot easier nowadays than before. And so that's one thing on the prevention side that we have to get a handle on, because if you think about it, there are kids as young as two years old playing on computers. Mm -hmm. And while there's tremendous advantages, there are some disadvantages to that. And I think to, to uh, piggyback with, with Josh's point, um, a traumatic event affects the individual, their family, neighbors and friends, survivors, uh, extends far beyond the instant event from ground zero, and a tremendous uh, change for that community and that individual. So although uh, most people can recover gradually over time, it leaves a footprint that if it's not addressed, it does create issues in terms of relationships, trust, productivity. We know that uh, in places where a, a violent uh, attack has occurred, uh, that whole system is compromised. Uh, we're all different. We all react to a, an abnormal event in our unique way. But what's common is the devastating impact it can have if there aren't supportive services available. Yeah. And that's an important part because like, I, I was very fortunate. I had a lot of services available to me, um, both statewide and, and also um, just because of, you know, as much as I hate to say it, socioeconomically where I come from, those services were available for me and I, I greatly credit that as part of the reason that I was able to and, and have been able to, to uh, continuously move forward and improve my quality of life. And um, that all comes from resources and how do you respond to these types of things if those resources aren't available? Right. And that's a huge problem that we have in, in some of these areas. So, so I, I, I want to piggyback on that a comment about um, resources and acknowledging the fact that resources for recovery and help are not uniformly distributed, right? Um, and since we know that's true, are there some things that we think should be non-negotiable, some things that every community should have and below which no community should be allowed to go when it comes to kind of seeking help for recovery for victims of violence and hate crimes? Have you seen anything that works really, really well, I guess is the question. What, I, what I'm super proud of with the FBI is that they devote considerable resources to their victim assistance program. So whenever there is a mass shooting, a terrorist attack, as well as other violent crimes, there will be a um, response by our victim specialists and ordinarily in, in large teams. And they are first responders who are there to help the directly impacted victims to get them psychological services, counseling, as well as lost wages and a variety of other things. To start those services and that response immediately is key, but then I'm always reminded of it's the victims themselves who are allowed to avail themselves of these services. Sometimes doesn't expand more broadly as I would love, right? If mm -hmm. we had all the money in the world, you could expand it across the world in the country mm -hmm. to say, who's ever been impacted by what happened to you is allowed to take advantage of these services. That would be ideal. Um, so I think there has to be a way to, to devote more money and resources 
into these existing programs to really make them expansive and allow people who feel traumatized and feel scared and feel like they've been victimized too to get services that they need to then go forward with their lives. Yeah. I mean, that's beautifully said and, and um, the only, I mean, the only thing that really pops into my head that, and, and the issue that I take is that we're all basing it on reactionary services. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the, um, you know, the panels later on today will kind of explore the preventative type of services that, that can be available, but um, I think that's a f it's far more cost effective for some of these community resources to be trying to be proactive as opposed to reactive. But um, it, all in all, it, in regards to the actual recovery efforts, I think you'll probably be able to speak a little bit more about it than I can, but just the availability of um, therapists and uh, mental health support and most for, in my perspective, in my opinion, you know, I, I went to therapy and that was wonderful, but what was even better than that was just having a close-knit community around me that all kind of rallied together. They allowed every one of my, you know, every member of my family to heal in the ways that they needed to heal. They took care of the things that we weren't able to take care of so that we could take the time to, to move forward and process what had gone on and, and seek out the services that we needed instead of having to worry about the mundane things of our day-to-day -day lives. So I think that was another tremendous thing and that's kind of what I always encourage and, and when I share my story and that's always the takeaway is make sure that when the news cameras go away and um, you know all these services start to dwindle and, and their, their focus is on the next major tragedy, um, you know, be the the support system that uh, that that community desperately needs. Thank you. You know, well said. The the uh, it's newsworthy yeah. for a short period of time, yeah. and resources come for a little bit, um, but then what happens? And so that's a challenge. Uh, the other challenge is that part of the reaction to a traumatic event is isolation and withdrawal. So you've got the assistance waning, and you've got some individuals that are unable to avail themselves of what's there, and there's the, the worry and the impact that's longstanding. Um, I also think that uh, prevention is key. When you look at the individuals that have engaged in uh, mass shootings or violent acts, um, and the after action report surfaces, all those elements, all those indicators of a pathway to violence were there long before. There's a tremendous history. And so what we try and do is identify those things. So if you, f if you see, see a six or seven year old that's already bullying other kids or espousing hate, that's the time to intervene. Because if not, it just gets harder. Once, those, once that ideation is solidified, once they go online and through various social media outlets solidify their beliefs, and in find other people that believe this, it promotes an unhealthy, uh, ethnocentric, narcissistic view of the world. So I think you're right. The idea is we gotta get ahead of this. And uh, it's there. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of educating people. It's, it's a matter of uh, developing situational awareness. And uh, we talk to students about uh, being good citizens. Right. You know, this could impact your brother, your sister, your best friend. Mm -hmm. So. If you see something that's problematic, bring it up, and we'll help. Uh, on the early stages, we talk about carefrontation as opposed to confrontation. You can punish somebody, but that's not helpful. You gotta give them some tools, some alternatives to the path they're heading. So I wanna piggyback on that, that comment you made about um, this issue of being helpful. And um, I'm consistently surprised by the fact that um, sometimes people are very reluctant to ask for help. Um, and so you mentioned the fact that it's easy, that there are markets out there, there's, if we're paying attention, we could help and intervene sooner, right? And so what do we have to do to kind of heighten people's awareness of the kinds of things that we should be on guard for, right? We're, we're talking about uh, prevention. It's like, what should we be looking for, kind of thinking about? some of the work that you're doing, if that's a big focus of what you're doing? Um, I mean, 
What to look for? That's a that's a tough one. You might be able to answer that a little better than I can, um, but. Uh, so let me let me ask it a slightly different way. Um, what would make it easier for people to ask for help? For a family to ask for help, for a kid, for for me to ask for help yeah. if I'm struggling? What, so are, what are we not doing there? A lot of my goal and a lot of the reason that I'm so open about everything that I've dealt with, and I will tell you every symptom that I've had from dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, I'm not afraid to hide any of that, is because I think what you're getting at is there's this massive stigmatization around mental health. And, um, and people are scared to admit that there's something wrong. Um, and so my main goal and, and a lot of what I do is just trying to make mental health a common topic that people understand. And I think as um, this younger generation continues to grow up, uh, they're becoming more aware of, of mental health and um, you know, for better or for worse. But uh, we're, we're slowly recognizing how important it is. You know, and, and it's also important to remember, and, and you can touch on this as well, mental health is still a rapidly growing and learning profession and a science. Um, you know, the, the DSM continues to change every couple of years because they're finding new things about mental health issues. They're finding out all sorts of uh, misunderstandings and, and issues that w in the ways that they've defined mental illness in the past. So we're still growing with that, and that's something that we as a society have to do together. And part of my goal and, uh, is, is to help people to understand that mental, mental health just like your physical health, you have to take care of it. You have to be on top of it. And when something goes wrong, you make note of it and you go talk to a professional about it. I think there's also the, um, the pressure on someone like you to become an activist. So you were involved in a very horrific situation. So you should be out there talking about it. You should be the, the front facing. You should be, <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> but the, the pressure on okay, well, you need to go out and do something. And um, I know that Dennis and Judy Shepard dealt with that as well. It's, yeah. it's, you have that choice of, I could be an, an, an outward facing advocate or, or not. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a whole other situation there of the pressure to do that. And well, maybe I don't want to, can I do it a different way? Or can I do it not in public and not on TV? Yeah. And so there's all these things. But I think to your point too is, and it's also exactly what you said, it's making this issue aware. You know, it's, it's why we're all here this morning with USC and with the Price School. It's making everybody aware that these issues exist and there are services out there to help people. I know with the FBI, there was, um, there's still agents who um, survived 9-11 and, you know, we lost an agent that day. We've lost several more since then due to illnesses being first responders in New York and at the Pentagon and in Pennsylvania. And the FBI has done a great job with saying, you know, we realize there's an issue here. Let's get out in front of it. Let's offer services to everybody, just in case there's someone out there that we don't know is struggling with somebody with something or will struggle with something in the future. Let's just put it out there and let it be a safe place and let it be known that we're here to help. And to your earlier point, I was under a lot of pressure throughout, you know, mind you, I was six years old at the time, and as I started to share my story and get my voice in my teens, I had a lot of people tell me that I had so much to give um, to people who, who were, uh, you know, dealing with uh, gun violence. And I had a lot of pressure that I had to get involved with this conversation, I had to do something, and I had to, um, you know, I had to be a resource for those people, and I started to find that I was not doing things on my terms. Mm -hmm. And that, all of a sudden, it became a burden for me, and it wasn't something that, uh, that I think was actually becoming a helpful resource, um, because I was getting burnt out. Yeah. Sure, sure. And, and I think, well said, that one of the best promoters of recovery are people that have gone through it and are able to share their story. Because it's that story, that commonality, that makes a difference for people to hear it. But you're right, the stigma about coming forward, uh, we constantly tell people, you know, when these things happen, it's okay to feel a number of 
emotions and feelings, and that's normal. But people don't always feel that way. They feel that they're alone in this, they're suffering alone, and that somehow coming forward means that you're weak. Uh, and I think we have done a good job of educating uh, first responders mm -hmm. on the fact that actually getting help is a sign of strength because the other side of it is to withdraw mm -hmm. and suffer in pain. And we know that oftentimes traumatic events will get exacerbated by unresolved traumatic events. So a moment will put a first responder or someone like Josh or any of us back in that situation that we never dealt with. So it's a, an ongoing uh, situation that requires people like Josh. Some people are very good to tell their story and they really help others. For other people, that's not what they want to do. But, but the point is talking about it either with family and friends, support, uh, understanding that you're not alone and that there isn't anything wrong with you are one of the key things. And so we try and do a lot of education. I think uh, the recovery, the, the peer network for those in recovery is a heck of a lot effective versus Dr. Tony telling Josh what he should do, right? That's not helpful. What, what's more important is to validate, to provide some affirmation, and to listen. What we tell people is listen to the person. They may not want to talk about it today, but maybe five years from now, something will uh, put them in a situation where they talk about it. Those are the right times. So I, it's really kind of interesting. Um, you talk about the fact both, I think, survivors and first responders and those who are training um, but the, the, the first responders have kind of multiple responsibilities. There's the responsibility to self, my own recovery, and making sure that I'm doing what I can to re restore some sense of uh, normalcy or balance, Defi deciding what my, my kind of um, obligation is to others and how much I'm going to invest in um, kind of other people healing. And so I'm going to kind of switch it a little bit because we've been talking about the survivors and the first responders, and we haven't really talked about the perpetrators, right? And the fact that some of those same networks, families, others who are friends and family, are also, in some regard, victims of the violence as well. Do you have any experience kind of sharing with the families of perpetrators and kind of how their kind of their role in the communities and it's kind of kind of going forward after these events um, when I was in the the FBI I I learned quickly that in a hate crime nobody wins everybody's losing the victim obviously has lost and the perpetrator has lost as well chances are he's a very broken individual something happened in his life that broke him somewhere along the way he lost his humanity and his compassion for somebody else how did that happen how did that happen and a lot of times it's not the parents fault it could be the cause of uh, something else that happened in his life it might not be the parents fault it, it may be we don't know but what we see is that both of these families the victims and the perpetrators are both suffering you think to Dylan Roof's parents in Charleston. You think of, of any set of parents whose son has just committed a vicious hate crime or mass murder. Can you imagine the trauma these parents are feeling? The siblings, the relatives, the friends, the communities, the bosses, the coworkers, thinking, I didn't know. Should I have done more? Should I have mm -hmm. tried to? So what are they going through? What are the families of the perpetrators going through and that's not that issue is not a very uh, uh, it's not one that's very popular to discuss it's easier to just be angry and vilify this evil person who has just killed children or killed worshipers in in a mosque for example it's a lot easier just to hate that person and not name them it's a lot more difficult to think wait a minute the victims need help he does too, and as does his family. And what as a society are we going to do to show our humanity to him? It's That's hard for me high to. High to, to no, it's a tough, tough I mean, issue. To, to put myself 
on the reverse side of things and to all of a sudden feel bad for somebody who, you know, while I agree 100% with what you're saying and, it, and it, you know, I wish that I was more capable of, of putting yeah. myself in that position. And I do think that they need help. I, my focus goes more to their families who have to live in the aftermath mm -hmm. of what their you know, relative has just done. But trying to put myself in the, the position of the, the person who shot me, like, you know, do I really... I don't know if I can do that. Like, it, it's a hard thing to do, and I think that's why we as a society struggle with that is because it really is, you know, how do you sympathize with somebody who's just done a really terrible thing? And, um, and so it's, you know, that's a hard, hard issue to tackle. But, uh, for example, the man who shot me was known by the state to be a, a, a violent and... Um, and somebody, a violent person, and somebody that they should keep an eye on. And I think his his family knew that. And but it's like, what can you do? You know, when you think back to the the UCSB shooting, um, hit, the shooter's family knew that there was issues. They called the police on it. They made those calls. They were worried. Yet they weren't able to to do anything. And it was, you know, unfortunately. You know, they tried, and because of events like that, I think it discourages people from continuing to try because they tried, and the law enforcement went down the right roads. They did the right things, and, and the family did the right things, and it just, you know, it still happened. They couldn't stop it, and I think stuff like that is what discourages the families from, from making those reports and from trying to, uh, trying to be forthcoming about what they might see as an issue. And you made a couple of points that are uh, noteworthy. One is that we have to be careful that we don't place survivors in a position of forgiving yeah. when they have gone through so much. That's a terrible burden to have. And uh, you're entitled to have that anger and that upset. And it's okay. It's, it's what you do with it that makes a big difference. And can you move it forward? Can you channel it in a better way? Um, when an event like this happens, we all try and explain it. And, and so one of the things that happens is we gotta find someone to blame. Mm -hmm. Someone's at fault. Back in the day, schizophrenia was seen as the result of a bad mother and that whole stigma. So when these things happen, it's the family. The family was dysfunctional. We have to, and, and if we're not careful, one, it's not too helpful. If we're not careful, it just breeds more hate. So it's not just, the family, but what does that family represent, right? And then you get into the racial things. You get into the religion things. And suddenly, you've mushroomed it in a way that's not too helpful. So I agree that it's a 360 approach, right? Because what will the family do with tremendous guilt? They withdraw and isolate, right? right? They become hypervigilant. Uh, they get traumatized. Hmm. Now, it's not for someone like Josh or survivors to address that issue. That's for other people, as you mentioned, to be aware of that and to recognize that if we don't get a handle on that, we perpetuate in another way, it's the same kind of hate and retaliation. If you look at the, um, in places where there have been traumatic incidents, I'm thinking of Beslan, Russia, where the schools were taken over, the kids, five years old, six years old, went through that. A number of the kids, the reaction was, I'm gonna become a fighter and avenge that. And the people that took over Beslan, uh, when they were asking, why are you here? When the parents were saying, when the kids were saying, we didn't do anything. Why are you here? They said, because we came to kill you because you killed our family. So trauma begets trauma. Violence begets violence. And so there need to be informed people that can rise above that. Because otherwise you do ha have a directed hate. You know, if someone looks Middle Eastern and, and they're the ones that, that are seen as the culprits, well, let's just hate all the Middle Easterners. Send them back home, right? And, and that's where we as community members have to be responsible for that on the front end. How, you, how do you build healthy relationships, healthy communities so that there's a place for conversation rather than action? And there's a place where I will know my neighbors and understand that, no, you didn't do it. You know, you're not like that. Because what people tend to do is they polarize. After every event, people polarize. And that's the 
downside of having a traumatic event and not having the conversation by professionals and people in a position to help uh, rise to the occasion. Because usually it's just what sells in the media. And it's, eh, here it goes, you know, another instance. And, and that's not helpful for communities or for families, whether they're uh, families of the perpetrator or those that are left behind after the tragedy. That, that, is, a, that is a great point. You don't see any articles, any um, op-eds, any uh, documentaries that focus on the families of the perpetrators. Is that going to sell in the media? Right? Is that a sympathetic story? It's probably not. I mean, but they, you know, they deserve to have their time. If they need to explain, if they need to just vent, if they need to just share what they've gone through as a victim of this, whatever incident we're talking about, they should be allowed to. You know, that should be picked up. That short, that story should be shared. Sure. And what I was, uh, I wanted to, to point at is that what does sell in the media is placing the blame on mental health. Mm. And I think, you know, we, we've covered that a lot today, but um, mental health isn't typically the issue behind it. And, uh, you know, I'm not a walking diagnostic uh, manual, but uh, the majority of mental health issues do not, do not include factors of extreme violence. That is stuff that comes outside of mental health issues. And so I think it's important that, um, you know, this, this whole conversation kind of has built upon the fact that we need to be an informed society and we need mm -hmm. to point out when, when things are going awry. And that's part of it is, is trying to correct the conversation when everything gets blamed on mental health. And you know, I might add that, that when we look at some of the characteristics that are common among school shooters, workplace violence, and, and uh, people at risk for radicalization, number of common characteristics, isolation, uh, disillusionment, a sense of marginalization, uh, no hope. And when you're in that situation and without supports, uh, you're at risk, right? And some people internalize it, other people, again, lay blame, right? Well, who put me in this situation? Mm -hmm. So whether it's uh, a Jewish American, an African American, a Hispanic, whatever it is, that becomes the way to organize this for yourself. And it's when we see that happening, when people begin to isolate in that way, uh, that's the time for intervention. So I want to, um, I appreciate that because you, you talk about this issue of intervention. And I was struck by, um, the, as we were going through introductions, how Josh, you um, used your experience and shifted it into some, an, an advocacy role for the benefit of the other of others. The Shepherds family took their family tragedy and said, "We're going to do something for a collective good as a result of this family tragedy." And do I mean? Can you talk a little bit about? Um, do they share part of that story about how how they got to that point, or did they just? I mean, it's kind of this bigger idea of um, I can't control what happened to get me in this situation, but I totally control what happens next and just owning that and kind of moving forward with that. Dennis and Judy Shepard were very much motivated by a sense that they did not want what happened to Matthew to happen to any other young person who identifies as LGBTQ. It was that along with a sense that their advocacy and their outreach and their pain and their sharing of this story is what their son would have wanted. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, of the reasons that they get up every morning and do what they do so passionately and with such um, openness and intensity is they feel that Matthew is communicating through them. Like they're sending this message of, he would want us to keep doing this. And that propels him, that propels them forward and keeps them, it keeps that story alive and it keeps this, um, what happened to him alive. And it, it helps other LGBTQ youth um, feel like there's somebody in their corner. There is somebody who 
again, turn their grief into action and are advocating on behalf of hopefully somebody who would be next? And how do we give that sense of, of inclusion and acceptance to the next group of children to make them feel okay about who they are and to live their lives openly and not to be scared, not to feel like if I live openly, I may be a victim just like Matthew was. No, it's you have to live openly and we're gonna do what we can to prevent that next tragedy. But a lot of it is just, they feel like that's what Matthew would have wanted them to do. For, you know, obviously I was six at the time, so I wasn't jumping into anything, <laughs> but uh, my parents and this eventually kind of came about the same way for me was there is no manual to how to respond to these types of things. And, you know, there's no guidelines, no rule books. What are you supposed to do? And this was the only thing that they could find that somehow took their anger and their distress and turned it into something positive. It was like, and, and they just needed some kind of outlet. And this was the outlet was becoming an activist and, and sharing the story. And that's how I got started in it. And I also found a, a small selfish portion that really like, uh, it helped me to heal. Sure. Sharing my story and, and teaching others um, helped me to, to grow as an individual, helped the people I was working with to, to improve their lives as well. But, um, you know, part of me, this is what I need too, to heal. And, and that's an important factor in it as well. But I do, you know, I always, every time I speak, I say if I, one, if I touch one person, yeah. that's enough. And if I've spoken to thousands of people in the last 10, 15 years, if I've even affected one life, it's worth it for me. Um, but I just, you know, I have a lot of issues that, uh, that if I just let them fester and, and, uh, and build up inside of me, then I might find myself on the wrong end of this conversation. So I had to, to do something. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I mean, again, that's why uh, Josh and others are the best spokespersons for these things because Dr. Tony can do whatever. But really, you have someone here who's lived it, gone through it. I think there's a role for the parents as well, as, as you have done, that, that then other families can identify with the real person. They don't have to read a book about PTSD. They don't have to think, well, this is, this is something that's unique. To No, it's an everyday person whose life was changed forever. And some people are make, able to make the step and make it a positive thing. Others worry and grieve quietly. That's okay, too. Not everyone needs to be in front of the camera. They have a place too, and they become part of that supportive background. I'd love to do it. I can't. I'm not ready. And that's okay. But I think the idea is to acknowledge that there's a tremendous opportunity when these things happen to give people hope and meaning and that there's a way forward. I think that's uh, amazing. And I, I just wanted to kind of summarize what I what I think was a really a compelling argument in the sense of um, recognizing the the breadth and the depth of the survivor network um, uh, individuals families their communities the first responders also recognize that um, we all have a role to play and maybe it's on, more on the preventive side so that we're doing something to prevent the next mm -hmm. tragedy and being open about what we see, risk sharing information that may uh, help someone along the way. And again, owning that, not saying that everybody has to follow a particular script, but everybody has a contribution. It's just us helping a, one another figure out where we can intervene and being honest about that. You know, and just to piggyback, when I do trainings about this, I usually ask the audience, well, Who's responsible for keeping you safe? And the answer is all of us. Right. All of us. Right. We all have that responsibility. And it starts by identifying people that need help, getting them the resources, uh, dealing with the stigmas of getting help, now I'm crazy. No, getting help because you're troubled and we can help you. So I think that's an important point. Yeah. So I think we have time. Any other closing remarks? I think um, we're... I mean, that was a really important piece that you just said that, you know, recognizing that when you're going through these things, you know, 
that that oftentimes came to my head like oh, I'm crazy and then I started to realize well um, my life is a little bit different than everyone else's I'm adjusting to the life that I'm living um, and I'm responding to the things that have happened to me so you know at the end of the day I think the takeaway message and the important thing is to do what is necessary for you in order to to respond to these types of tragedies some people some people do it quietly and that's okay sure. some people need to you know I need to share my story that's what provides me with comfort sure. and that's how I move forward I learn something new about myself every time that I share my story so it's important to recognize that everyone heals in their own way but what we need to do is to be that resource and to be there whenever they're ready to start talking, to be that person who's ready to listen. And I'm sorry, but I think we're done. <laughs>